We are here in Leicester to uh, meet Ibrahim Hewitt. I've known Ibrahim for nearly 30 years. I never asked him how he made his journey to Islam. I'm going to do this today, so please come with me. Well, Brother Ibrahim, we've known each other for more than 30 years, probably. Yeah, I, alhamdulillah. Uh, but I don't remember ever having heard from you uh, how your journey to Islam uh, really? was made. Spana. So it's time. Tell me. Now's the how time. did you make that journey? Oh, Akbar. Bismillah. Uh, right. It's, it started, I was actually on a holiday in South Africa with uh, an Indian Muslim family. Uh, who I'd met some of the members here, and we went out there. They invited me to go and have a holiday in South Africa. This was in 1979, during the height of apartheid. Mm. I had to get a special permit to stay in a non-white township. And everywhere I went, I saw you know, whites only, non-whites only. I couldn't... So not only coloured and blacks were not allowed into white areas, whites, whites were not allowed into coloured and... Uh, you could, but you couldn't stay there. You weren't supposed to stay there mm. because that would lead to mixing. And this was, the, you know, this was uh, against the law. Yeah. So everywhere we went, we had problems because they'd taken me to, from Joburg. We went to Durban. We went around doing all the tourist things. And we wanted to go and eat somewhere. Where do we go and eat? You kind of go into a non-white restaurant because I'm with them, we kind of go to a white restaurant because they're with me, so... You, know, you we were had, the problem. <laughs> yeah, we, we end up with sandwiches all the time, everywhere, you know. Mm. And even go, to go for a swim in the Indian Ocean, couldn't go on the white beach because they were with me. All the beaches were segregated, everything oh, was segregated. What a life. Yeah, except the mosques. And this really struck me very deeply because they took me to a new mosque which had been designed by an Englishman. So I thought, oh, okay. And... Um, I they, went in there. They, they took you as an English As tourist. an English, yeah, to, the, to this <laughs> English design mosque. Yeah. And um, it must have been after Maghrib. And there was like a curfew. Once it's dark, you had to be in your own township type thing. Unless you were white, then you could move around easily. But non-whites, it was like that. And I noticed in the mosque that there was African Muslims and Indian Muslims praying side by side. Now, this was in a township, an Indian township, just across the way from Soweto, the African township. Mm. This struck me, hold on, all this apartheid that I've seen, all this division according to race, what's it about Islam and the Muslims that brings the people together? So when I came back after my holiday, I uh, bought two or three books from Forces, the students' organisation in North London. I was living down south at that time and started just to read a translation of the Qur'an and a couple of other little books. Over two years... How did you know about Fosses? Somebody gave me a, a leaflet and it had... Um, they said that they sell books about Islam on the back. I don't know where I got it from. Wallahi, I don't know where I got it from. Maybe one of the family over there, because he'd studied here. I'm not sure. But uh, I, mean, I, I ordered it by post and it, it came. And so I started reading about Islam. And although I wasn't a particularly strong Christian, um, in fact, I was a very weak Christian, I was probably more of an agnostic. Didn't, I believed, but I didn't know what I believed. Mm. Um, and I'd always had a problem with the Trinity, you know, the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost, now the Billah. And when I started to read about Islam, la ilaha illallah, I thought, hold on. Old Testament, first commandment, the Lord thy God is one. Mm. 
In the New Testament, Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one. La ilaha illallah. It's the same. Okay, that figures. And then when I read about Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, particularly the, the, the story of when the Quraysh offered him wealth, power, influence to be the king. No, give me the sun in my right hand, moon in my left hand. You know, I won't stop until Allah's message is clear. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam clearly wasn't doing this for his own benefit. He could have had everything worldly. He could have had that, but he didn't. So he started to think, okay, this, this, this man was real. This man was genuine. So I started to read deeper and then thought, okay, prohibition on pork and alcohol. And he said, I just cut things out bit by bit by bit. You started by yourself? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I'd had no contact with Muslims back in this country mm. at all. And um, so I started doing this and, and it, it made perfect sense. And I remember one day I came home from work. I was a salesman at the time for an insurance company. And I was having a bad day, one of those days when nobody wants to see you. And, you know, so I came home and um, it was raining and it was dark. It was middle of winter. And I thought, oh, you know. So I just put, sat down and I was reading and I just put my head on the floor. And I said, yeah. I can't remember if I said, yeah, Allah, or God, please help me. You know, I was living all alone, 200 miles from home. And uh, just asked for help. And then, after, you know, that was that. And then after a while, I had to go on business up to Kilburn. And that was not my area. I never went to business to Kilburn on business. My neighbourhood. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Just up the road from you. Yeah. And uh, it was the old Nat National Westminster Bank on Kilburn High Road. It's closed now. I see yes. it's closed now. I was there a couple of weeks ago. They moved it to the other side. Okay. So I went in there. And as I was coming back, driving back to Watford, where I was living at the time, driving up, shoot uphill, I thought, ah, oh, this student's place is just around the corner. Let me go and see if they've gotten any more books. Fosses. Fosses. <laughs> So I went and I knocked at the door, and uh, there's a Sudanese brother, Hassan Hamad, bless him. He answered the door. So I go, and I said, what's he saying, you know? <laughs> and uh, I said, I just want some books. Yeah, come in, come in, come in, come in, come in. He put me down, give me a cup of tea. And then he told me afterwards that he went straight on the phone to a man called Muhammad John Webster. I don't know if you remember Muhammad yes, John Webster. Yes, yeah, I remember. Bless him, yeah, Allah bless him. Yeah. Muhammad John, come quickly. There's an Englishman here. Ninety percent is going to become a Muslim. <laughs> Allahu Akbar. I went to buy some books. Ninety percent is going to become a Muslim. Muhammad John came round, and he was telling him in front of you. No, or, no, no, no. He was, told you afterwards. afterwards uh, yeah. He told you afterwards. So we sat and we we're talking there, and then uh, I was explaining to them what I'd been doing and reading, and I just wanted some more books. And we just got talking. It was a Friday morning, and they. Uh, I said, well, why don't you come to the mosque with us and see what's happening? I said, yeah, okay. So I had a company car. We all piled into my car. We went to Regent's Park. And, uh, Rather than they drive you, you drove I them. I drove them to the mosque. <laughs> I think they only asked me to get a lift to the mosque, maybe. Allah yeah. and, and we went to the mosque, and it was, Juma, it was packed. And we, I was standing watching them. They showed me how to make wudu. And then I was standing watching them praying and sort of, you know, all, all this business and... And then afterwards, we went and sat in the main hall, and there's another Sudanese brother called Dr. Ali Al Tahir, mm. who was a student at the time doing his PhD. And uh, I made shahada. Subhanallah. I hadn't set out that day to become a Muslim. I hadn't intended to become a Muslim at all. Allah answered your prayer. Sahir. <laughs> it's so true. <laughs> you asked him yeah. to guide you. Yeah, subhanallah. Mm, subhanallah. And you know, I've never shaken so many hands as I. People coming up to congratulate me. Suddenly I had this whole new family and friends and this whole new network. And I, I remember driving back to, to Watford and thinking, God, oh, subhanAllah. What have I done? I've, you know, I've got, I'm a Muslim. I've, I've got to stop <laughs> praying. I've got to, you know, and alhamdulillah. But Allah made it so easy for me. Mm. Now, how about the aftermath? I mean, it's, uh, embracing Islam uh, affects your relations with your own mm. Uh, family, your uh, acquaintances. What happened to you? Uh, well, that was hard because I was living away, as I say, my family from Newcastle. I was just outside London. And us Geordies from Newcastle, you know, alcohol plays a huge part in your life. Yeah, I remember my days in Sunderland. Yeah, it's, oh. it's, it's the big thing. Mm. If you don't drink, what's wrong? 
you know, there's a problem if you don't, if you don't. And I remember about three weeks after I'd become a Muslim, my cousin in Scotland got married. So I went up there for the wedding and a Scottish wedding is even more than, you know. Anyway, and they said, what are you drinking? I said, a Coke, please. Why? <laughs> you know, they think I was like, come from outer space or something. <laughs> and um, I, the funny thing is, my, my older cousin there, he asked my, my brother, he said, what's wrong with Brian? He's not drinking. And my brother turned out and said, oh, I don't know, maybe he's become a Muslim or something. Huh? He said that? Wallahi. Subhanallah. Allah Akbar. He didn't know. I hadn't told anybody. I hadn't told anybody. But the thing is, you know, it was funny because where I was working, my boss hated beards. And I remember one guy who started to grow a beard and Mr. Quiller, his name was David Quiller, said, no, take it off. Yeah, you know, they believe that in, a, in the PR business, you yeah, must have a beard, beard is not yeah. good. Yeah. So I, he was on holiday when I became Muslim. And by the time he came back, you had the beard. I, I started to grow the, the, the beard. Ah, come here, what's this? <laughs> and I told him I'd become a Muslim. This is the sunnah of the Prophet Wasallam. Okay, no problem. Oh, he tolerated you? No problem. Oh. He, well, he, he used to leave his office, let me pray in his office. SubhanAllah. In the winter... If I'm on a, stuck on a phone call uh, at a Smachrib, he'd walk past me and he's going, look at the time, your prayers. <laughs> he'd he remind you. Yeah, it made it so mm. easy for me. Mm. But then the big thing was to go and tell my parents. Mm. And that's Christmas. So it, it didn't affect your work? It didn't affect my work oh. at all. Other than that, I was selling life assurance and it was all to do with Reba. Mm. And again, my boss, I explained to him the situation. And he made it possible for me to not be a salesman, to come in as an office manager. Ah, so okay. I didn't have to try and sell something I didn't really believe in. Well, he was a noble guy. He was, very, he was a very good man, very good man. Okay, your parents then. Yeah, so my parents, it was coming up to Christmas and, I, you, know, you know, when you become a Muslim, sometimes you're, it's like a pendulum. You're way off on that side and you become Muslim, you swing all the way to that side. So I was very sort of hardcore in many ways. And I didn't want to get involved in Christmas. Now, looking back, I can say, mm, shouldn't have done that. Maybe I should have been more Should have been uh, softer. Yeah. yeah, should have been softer. But mm. that's not the advice I was getting. Mm. Khair, alhamdulillah. But that's the human nature. When you shift from one situation to another, you become initially a, a, some sort of a radical. Well, it was, everything was so clear. Mm. And this was the beauty of Islam for me, that uh, I was supposed to be Christian before the Church of England in this country so wishy-washy. Uh, I was there was an issue. I was actually brought up in prison as a Methodist in the Methodist Church, not the Church of England, because there was an issue there. So it was, things were all very different and wishy-washy. But Islam was very clear, and for me, it was like black and white. There were no grey areas. In that sense, it's it's comforting. It was comforting because there was, there was a, a sort of a foundation, a solid foundation to build everything on. I wasn't sort of lost and drifting or anything, it was solid foundation, alhamdulillah. But I had to go and tell my parents, so I, I drove up to there and I sat them down one day, I said, look, mum and dad, there's no way, other way to say this, but I've become a Muslim. You can hear a pin drop. <laughs> they went silent. Yeah. So my mum, bless her, you know, they're both passed away now, so, subhanallah. Um, my mum said, oh, uh, do you go to some kind of church or something? <laughs> I said, I go to the mosque. And my dad jumped up and said, you don't need a mosque, you need a madhouse. He said, I'm going out for 20 minutes, you'd better not be here when I come back. Oh. So I said, I'm sorry to hear that, Dad. Anyway, he went out. So I explained to my mum, I said, don't worry, I said, things will be fine. And it, it did. I used to meet my mum at my brother's house. After that, my dad was really... Did it remain like that? No, alhamdulillah. Uh, I got a phone call one day about 18 months later, and uh, he phoned us his... Your dad here, your mum's seriously ill in hospital, you better come home. So I went home and we he agreed with me nicely. Mm. And that was started to build and rebuild the relationship. And alhamdulillah, over the years, I mean, my mum told my, my wife uh, that he's a much better person as a Muslim than he was as a not Muslim. Subhanallah, she said so. Yeah, mm. yeah. She never told me. She never told me. But uh, she saw a difference in my attitude, my 
uh, the way I spoke to people, the way I dealt with people. Uh, she saw a big difference, and for her, it was very much an improvement on what it was before. Now, unlike uh, some uh, people who convert to Islam, you, from I guess from the beginning, you became active. You did not just keep it to yourself. Or am I wrong? Because at least since I've known you, you've yeah. been active. Uh -huh. Well, it was, I suppose it's, it depends who you're with mm. when you become Muslim. I mean, I... Very much the first few weeks and months, I used to be at Forces every, you know, every week. And Muhammad John Webster, he was a great guy, and we'd be sitting having dinner with about people from 20 different countries. Now, for a lad from Newcastle like me, who for the first 20 years of my life, 21 years of my life, I never spoke to anybody who wasn't white and English mm -hmm. or Scottish. It just didn't happen. Because there was nobody around in where I lived. So moving to the south was one an eye opener. So it wasn't just a new religion; it was a completely new culture. environment, culture, everything. Mm -hmm. And I remember sitting with uh, Muhammad John and all these brothers was from Sudan, from North Africa, from Malaysia, from Middle East, from Pakistan. All these, br and Muhammad John Webster would sit there and he'd say, "Listen to this," and he'd make some outrageous statement, and then he'd just sit back while they all start arguing, you know. And it was brilliant like that because <laughs> you start to see, and it, it was very much that they were there and they were showing me different opinions and mm. stuff like that. But then after three weeks, I remember going up for Juma. I didn't know that if there was a mosque where I lived in Watford, there was sort of, and we got that going, we kick-started that. But I remember going for Juma again at Regent's Park with Hassan Hamad, with Hassan, the brother I had seen originally at Forces. And... Uh, the Adhan started and I turned straight away and I said, that's Yusuf Islam. He was giving the Adhan? He was giving the Adhan. And you could hear Cat Stevens' voice clearly. Yeah, you recognize him from his voice. From the voice, yeah. Oh. So we, I met him, I introduced myself afterwards. And uh, so he, he sort of said, oh, Islam, how are you, brother? Alhamdulillah, nice to meet you. Are you married? I said, no, I'm not married. It's very important you get married. <laughs> yeah. Okay, inshallah. Yeah. So that was it, but That's his dawah. that was his dawah, yeah. <laughs> and um, so I, I actually started to go to the Islamic circle with Yusuf, and he and I became and remained very, very good friends, alhamdulillah. So I, I worked with Yusuf and, and active in, as his personal assistant, and then as um, involved with the education side of things that he's involved with. So this sort of spread, and, and it was through Yusuf that I got involved with Palestine. So... And, and that reminds me of, uh, of, this, of this community, the community of converts. Mm. Uh, talking to some people, you, have a, you get a sense from them that initially they feel lonely, they feel isolated. Some of them were warmly welcomed by the uh, community, by the Muslim community. Um, others feel that they were not uh, sufficiently cared for. Okay. I, I know, I've seen that a lot. Mm. I think it's down to the individual. Um, I certainly didn't feel lonely. And I, I, I don't have a problem with loneliness. Because you started with forces. Yeah. <laughs> I was there straight away and, and there, was, there was plenty of people to meet and know. And, um, I, but I, I enjoy my own company anyway. Now I'm, I'm comfortable with who I am and I can spend time on my own without a problem. Even at that time, I, I've heard this before, you know, the, the, the Muslims don't do enough for the new Muslims. Okay, that's, that's true to a certain extent, but it's a two-way street. Mm. You know, we mustn't walk into a mosque and assume that, look at me, I'm a new Muslim, everybody must come forward and do something for me and greet me, and I'm, look at me, I'm, you, know. you know. I remember going to the mosque early on in Watford and places, East London even, and you'd walk in and everybody would look at you as if you've got two heads or something, you know, <laughs> because it was strange then. This was the early 1980s, 1981. It was very strange to see an English Muslim or a white Muslim. They were there. People were around. I mean, people like Dawood Rasa Owen and you know, lots of been Muslims from the 60s and 70s. But it was unusual. Mm. Even when I went for Hajj first time, 1984, it was, the Iron Curtain was still down, so you didn't get all the European, the East European Muslims that you see now, the Bosnians and all that sort of thing. You didn't get that. So I remember being on Arafat, on Yawm al-Arafat, Ihram, everything. 
and his brother came up to me and made salam, started speaking to me in Turkish. He thought you were Turkish. He thought I was a Turk, yeah. And in those days, even the Turks were generally the older, middle aged and older. Well, if people. I didn't know you, I would mistake you for a Turkish. Well, that's fine. <laughs> so he started talking to me in Turkey, Turkish. And uh, I said, uh, sorry, 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 uh, English, English. You English? I said, yeah. Are you a Muslim? <laughs> In Arafat? <laughs> oh, in Arafat. So I sort of looked at, you know, the, the Ikram, and, and then he laughed and we did, you know, and we, we sat down, we had a little bit of chat in, in the thing, in, in as much as the English that he had, and you know, I have no Turkish. Yeah, I think most Muslims it was associated Islam with a culture rather than with humanity. Yeah, yeah. I mean, although so, although Rasulullah was sent yeah, to Al-Alamin, yeah. to, to, to all the yeah. yeah, but this, this is what's, this is what's, uh, we find now is that the, you know, there are so many more non-traditional Muslims, if you like, mm. uh, and so it's not so, such a big deal now. But it's, it's at that time. I, I don't know. If, you know, yeah, we can always do more to help people, but it's, it's a two-way, two-way street. And I think if we just isolate ourselves and expect to be treated very differently, that's not always going to work. It depends where you are and who you who you're with. But as I say, Alhamdulillah. I mean, I was always in this sort of environment where people were active. So the activism was there from the beginning. I was there by default and I got involved and you, you get, get known and asked to talk. As a new Muslim, you're often asked to go and give a talk somewhere or you go and visit a school to, to speak to the kids about your faith, why you've become a Muslim. Uh, and it would break the, the mold, if you like, to see, a, see and hear a Geordie accent a white man going in to speak about a faith which most of the people associated with Pakistanis or Indians or mm. maybe Arabs, but not even Arabs, but Pakistanis and Indians, because that was the, the community that they saw. Well, for, for, for people like me, uh, people who were born uh, and raised as uh, Muslims, it is really very important uh, when we uh, become acquainted with people like Ibrahim and his brothers and sisters who embrace Islam, because it reminds us of something we keep forgetting about Islam, that Islam is not for the Arabs, yeah. it's not for the Pakistanis or the Indians or the Africans. Islam is for humanity. Yeah. Well, I, I used to always think this is important, and I always used to point out to people, and I remember doing something in, in, uh, in Dublin once. I was there doing teacher training with uh, a wonderful brother, a wonderful friend, Muhammad Akram Khan Chima. Uh, who was a great educationist and very active. And he, he and I were doing some teacher training. And then in the evening, the community asked us to, sp to speak to the parents. And so we were talking. And after the education bit, and Brother Ibrahim, when did you become a Muslim? Inevitable. Uh. <laughs> so I said, Alhamdulillah, I became Muslim in 1981. When did you become a Muslim, brother? And when did you become a Muslim, sister? When? Well, we were born Muslim. Don't give me we were born Muslims. You were born into a Muslim home. You are given a, a head start over people like me in that you grew up hearing Allahu Akbar, la ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You, you, you grew up within an Islamic environment. But when you are old enough to think for yourself, you have to decide to be, to be a Muslim. Yeah, after all, Islam is based on free choice. Yeah. You have to make shahada. You have to be a Muslim yourself. You have to make a conscious decision that I want to live my life as a Muslim. Because one day, mom and dad are not going to be around to get you up for suhoor during Ramadan. They're not going to be around to get you up for salah, take you to the mosque. No, you have to do this yourself. So it's, it's, it's just that every, every Muslim has to have gone through the same journey, but just by different routes, that's all. Yeah. Now, the years since you have uh, become Muslim um, here in Britain, as well as in, in the West in general, uh, Islam has repeatedly been under attack. Mm -hmm. Has this uh, affected uh, the way Westerners perceive Islam, or, or has there been an increase in the number of people who convert to Islam? Well, it's, it's sort of paradoxically, there's, I think, I don't, I don't know statistics. There are no accurate statistics to show how many people have become a Muslim. But from what we hear, when people hear all these bad things, 9 11, uh, the Rushdie time, people went out to buy a copy of a translation of the Quran to find out what's, what's, what's this about? What's, what's all this all about? <laughs> and then they become Muslim. Mm, subhanAllah. So it's, it's you know. 
if you, it's, it's, it depends on the heart. If you've got the, an open heart and an open mind, then you're going to understand that, yeah, there are different ways, different approaches, and that basically, although they wouldn't know the terminology, that Judaism, Christianity, as it was, and Islam, this, it's, all, it's all Ahl al-Kitab, it's all people of the book. And it's all from the same source. Yeah. So there's a natural progression. And so it shouldn't be unusual. And, and a lot of the times when there's people who are anti-Islam, it's more to do, I think, with racism, with ignorance. Because Christianity didn't originate in London or England or Canterbury, where the Archbishop of Canterbury is head of the Church of England. No, it's a Middle Eastern religion. Not far away from Mecca in yeah, Jerusalem. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So, you know, this, this sort of thing, a lot of ignorance. And so the, the attacks on Islam, you know, the Prophet of Islam had attacks on him. Mm. So why, we shouldn't be surprised about that. Shaitan told Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we're going to try and divert the, the people away. So we shouldn't be surprised at that. Yeah, there was one time I remember uh, I was invited to go and speak to a gathering of monks and priests, Christian priests uh, at Burford Priory, which is near Oxford. And it was about uh, Islam and people of other faiths. So I wrote a nice academic style paper and I, I got there and I looked. And there's a whole group there, and, uh, including a few uh, bishops. So I said, okay. I said, okay, I just want to remind you, I'm a Muslim. I shadu la ilaha illallah wa I shadu anna Muhammad an abduhu wa rasulu. There is no God but Allah, and Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. And I invite you all to become Muslims for your salvation. And there was silence. Don't come to me running to me on the day of judgment to say nobody told you about Islam. <laughs> and they all started laughing just like that. And once they started laughing, that broke the ice and we started to uh, be able to get it. It was really good. And in the afternoon, uh, I prayed outside, lovely day. I was praying on the grass outside. In the afternoon, the, 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 the abbot, the head, head guy at the place, came and asked me if I would recite some Quran for the community. They all live there, the, 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 uh, the monks. So he took me into the chapel and they were in the middle of a service. It was a proper service. They pray like seven times a day. They're having services in there. And he said, okay, so this is the order of service. This is where you speak here. I was like, what, what do I do? So I recited from Surah Saf about Isa alayhi salam asking the Hawariyin, Man yes. Ansari ilallah, right? Who's the, which amongst you are going to be the helpers of Allah? And then I did it in the translation in English. And they were crying. Really? They were crying because they didn't realize that Isa is mentioned in the Quran. Even the disciples are mentioned in the Quran. Allahu Akbar. So this is the way, you know, you get to people's hearts by telling the truth. Mm. We don't have to shy away from the Quran. Let people hear the Quran. Let people understand the Quran. Know what's in there. It's not just all about chopping hands off and heads off and flogging people and this and this. No. Islam is about development. It's there to enrich society. It's there to take people forward, Sharia, to take people forward to Jannah, inshallah. So this was, this was beautiful for me. It was, it was brilliant, but it was, you know. How long ago was that? Oh, it was about 20 years ago now. Mashallah. Alhamdulillah, it was really, really good. good Jazakallah khairan. Alhamdulillah. <laughs>